Agent Morris with the NSA. There is something real here. Did you believe that our government is in possession of the agents? Uh, absolutely, based on interviewing uh, over 40 witnesses over four years. And, and, and where? I know the exact locations, and those locations were provided to the Inspector General and from which to the Intelligence Committees. I actually had the people with the first-hand knowledge um, provide a protective disclosure to the Inspector General. Uh, biologics came to some of these recoveries. Yeah. Those could represent uh, exquisite new adversary technology. Non-human, and that was the assessment of people uh, with direct knowledge on the program I talked to that are currently still on the program. The government is covering up some level of its knowledge and understanding about what some of those things are. The Seoul Foundation, which just announced a new initiative for UFO research and policy. It's nuts, man. I mean, we're just small town buds who saw a UFO in the woods. I mean, now we're hanging out with the government. Wow. <laughs> what floor were you guys on? Good evening, everybody. This is Smiles Lewis. Welcome to another edition of Anomaly Now, straight out of Austin, Texas. This is the weekly live news media roundup for the 501c3 nonprofit Anomaly Archives based here in Austin, Texas, founded in 2003. It's like our 21st year. Thanks for joining us. Hey, really want to thank everybody who pushed us over the edge and got us up to 400 subscribers to our YouTube channel. Really appreciate that. So shout out to all the y'all who helped with that. Really appreciate that. Thank you so much. Well, uh, coming up in uh, just a few weeks, we're going to have our third installment of the new monthly Anomaly Archives, Anomaly Academy monthly online lecture series featuring awesome researcher Joshua Cutchin. That's going to be Saturday, August 24th. And he's going to be presenting Soulcraft, Understanding the UFO as a Death Symbol. You can find out more about Josh at joshuacutchin.com. That's J-O-S-H-U-A-C-U-T-C-H-I-N.com. He's a fantastic researcher and has put out some of the best books on the subject of UFOs, the paranormal, and Bigfoot in many, many years, and uh, is just a great guy. You can consider joining our patron Patreon. We'd really appreciate the help. You can go to patreon.com slash anomalyarchives. You can go to anomalyarchives.org and find the link there, and that'll take you to where you can sign up for monthly donations, become a, a patron, a donor, a supporter. We'd really appreciate the help. There's levels that range from $1 a month to $20 a month. $10 a month is the Anomaly Academy Cadet level that gets you access to each month's live online lecture that allows you to participate and see it all as it's happening. And then also you get access to all the previous month's materials. Hope you'll consider doing that. Meanwhile, as usual, over at our Flipboard are a ton of great articles and information that you might find of note. We're going to touch on a bunch of different articles, interesting information and news. You know, I've noticed TMZ, <laughs> that tabloid news outlet, has been really going into the UFO scene now. And sure enough, at the end of last month, they did a, a little video on crypto terrestrials, aliens walking among us. The crypto terrestrial hypothesis is really getting a lot more coverage of late, and I think that's a good thing. It's one of the hypotheses with regard to UFOs that I lean towards. There's a great interview over at sky at nightmagazine.com. Historian Greg Agigian looked at the history of reported UFO sightings. This is what he found. There's also an interview with uh, Mike Shermer of Skeptic Debunkering or Fame. I've actually found some of his interviews to be pretty good. There's all these other great stuff here. You know, this article over at Business Insider is not UFO related at all. It is about people's <laughs> insurance, house insurance going up when confronted by home insurers using drones to analyze the imagery of their roofs. But look at this image here. For those listening to the audio playback podcast, it's basically got a typical drone hovering above a house with a pink beam levitating a 
a, a flagellating individual, a human out of the roof of their house with the, the shingles flying everywhere. It's about somebody who's rent or insurance, uh, their, their, their house insurance premium going up because of surveillance from these drones. Whole other issue that I'm not going to get into, but just again, another example that cargo culture where UFOs and paranormal imagery makes its way into the zeitgeist via advertising and so so, and so forth. Another interesting article making the rounds on various websites, Hobbit Bone from Tiny Species of Ancient Humans Found on Indonesian Island. This this particular one is over at The Guardian. And a couple of interesting video reports from John Purvis over at CBS4Local.com. at CBS, the number four, L-O-C-A-L.com. He's a longtime newscaster and who's from Roswell. And in these two video vignettes is reflecting on the recent Roswell festival there in New Mexico, as well as how this story of Roswell reemerged back in 1980. And he talks about how he had growing up in the town, never heard about this Of course, He wasn't interested in UFOs, but then even if he had been, it was not something that you would stumble across easily. There just wasn't a lot of information about that, but you can go to CBS for local.com these two articles, one from July 30th, tough questions. What story has shadowed my entire 44 year TV news career? And he's just talking about how as soon as people hear that he's from Roswell, they, of course, what do you think they ask? You know, are the, is the story true? Are there aliens? Are you an alien? Silly things like that. But he interviews, of course, Don Schmidt and talks about just the rise of the festival, how it started in 1997, which I believe was like the 50th anniversary or thereabouts. And has just been getting bigger and bigger ever since. And then a week later, he did this Roswell UFO story. Still resonates around the world 77 years later. A lot of other great article links here. Keith Thompson, who wrote one of the best UFO books ever back 30 years ago, is uh, re-interviewed by Jeffrey Mishlov on his New Thinking Aloud series. I always recommend Keith Thompson's perspective and his original book. He's got a new book on UFOs out that he's talking about. Good stuff. We've also got the link here where you can urge Congress to pass the UAPDA disclosure in 2025. This is the second attempt at trying to get the the UAP UFO Disclosure Act ratified into, I guess they're going to, it didn't work when they tried to get it last year through the NDAA, but they're trying it again this time with a Republican Mike Rounds and as previously initiated Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer. This link goes to newparadigminstitute.org where you can submit your information to your representatives via a form there and basically encourage them to s- sign the petition or rather to sign on to the legislation. Meanwhile, over at the Observer Substack, a litmus test for UFO beliefs, artist and all around creative person Shara Barsotti blesses the Observer with an analysis of UFO beliefs. She's also apparently a painter, I believe. Some other great stuff. This one a long form video from a Fox affiliate on Jesus James, James Jesus Angleton, former head of the CIA called CIA JFK assassination, Israel Watergate, Cold War dynamics, Aaron Good on James Jesus Angleton. Haven't had the chance to finish the whole thing, but out of the gate, just watching a little bit of the speech seemed like it was a, a pretty interesting take on digging up information about the CIA and all kinds of documents that are slowly being released as they should have been a long time ago. But let me just jump into some other areas. You know, coming up in a week or two is the Society for UAP Studies online summer conference. And if you go to the the debrief.org, there is this article by Micah Hanks interviewing some of the people associated with that. And that is titled Academics Unite to Bring Humanities to the Study of Aerial Mysteries at Society for UAP Studies event. And he interviews a lot of the different particulars, folks involved. This is yet again, I think, a great sign of what has long needed to happen in terms of the scientific disciplines finally trying to tackle the UFO subject without just layering on more ridicule of the phenomena and the people who claim experiences with it. Greg Agigian is mentioned here, along with interdisciplinary dialogue. Agigian told the debrief that another aim of the society's event involves another of the subject's most enduring problems. Quote, speculation about UAP is often unmoored from any empirically sound and self-critical research, Agigian said. 
The conference seeks to address this shortcoming by placing multidisciplinary scholarship about the subject center stage, unquote. And there's going to be a workshop on UAP citizen science, among many other things. You can see the whole lineup by going to society for uapstudies.org. And I'll provide the link to the UAP Studies Conference Summer 2024 page where they have a list of all the speakers. You can register. It's still got an early bird special for $65. gets you access to the three-day event. Now, they are, do have private workshops that are by invite only, but a lot of public presentations by very interesting people, including Dr. Brenda Densler, Dr. Bertrand Mehust, Wesley Waters, Douglas Butner, Gretchen Stallman, and others. You can find the whole a list of presenters there, as well as the workshops that are, as I say, are by invite only, as well as the actual schedule of events that goes off starting Friday, August 16th, and running through Sunday, August 18th. So check that out. Definitely not your usual UFO conference, and I think that's a good thing. I do think there needs to be more academic involvement, and we'll be talking a little bit more about that, including UAPcheck.com has this article, UAP and Academia, a Strained Relationship. Recent survey of 1,460 faculty members from 144 American universities offers an updated overview of how the UAP topic is perceived in the academic environment and whether more scientific research would be desirable. For some reason, the Flipboard will not let me flip UAPcheck.com articles into it. I suspect there's some SEO problem there that it thinks ill of this website, but this goes into this recent study with some detail. And there's other related articles uh, that we're going to link to, including this one, Academic Freedom and the Unknown, Credibility, Criticism, and Inquiry Among the Professoriate, the abstract. Uh, this is, in fact, the, the same study that the uh, the UAP check article is referencing. And then over, well, the Oops, didn't show you that. Yes, Academic Freedom and the Unknown, Credibility, Criticism, and Inquiry Among the Professoriate. This over at nature.com, published just, I believe, a few days ago on August 1st. Meanwhile, there is Heath Basterfield's synopsis of the three sessions that were held at the 2024 American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics Conference. This is the one that I mentioned that the SCU, the Scientific Coalition for UAP Studies, that Robert Powell, Austin's own UFO researcher, got a presentation scheduled for. And this went off at the end of July, beginning of August. And these three sessions doesn't really give any description of them. I don't think he was able to, Keith was able to attend, but he found apparently the, the abstracts and synopses of these three presentations, all of which I believe were part of a session called Advancing the Scientific Understanding of UAP to Improve Aviation Safety. And as we've been saying for some time now, This is not a new idea. There has been organizations focused on UFOs and aviation safety for some time, but it's finally getting the attention it deserves. And these sessions ranged from reinforcement learning for cognitive detection and characterization of advanced aerospace vehicles by Rajiv Thumala and Gregory Falco, as well as the one by Robert Powell. Let's see. Yeah, the reported shape, size, kinematics, electromagnetic effects, and presence of sound of unidentified aerial phenomena frame select re- from select reports 1947 to 2016. Robert Powell, Larry Hancock, Leba Hassan, Sarah Little, Robinson Truong, and Toby Kamalru, all presenting for this this abstract there, which goes into some. Details. Now, this is pretty fascinating. Out of more than 100,000 reports amassed from one military database and four civilian databases, 301 cases, 301 reports spanning the same years, 47 to 2016, were identified as meeting the criteria of, after having been hand sorted for reliability of witness testimonies, object angular size greater than 0.15 degrees, sufficient lighting, and sufficient information detail. And they yeah, sussed out 301 reports out of 100,000 reports. The largest shapes reported were diamond rectangular and boomerang, median of 300 feet, and the smallest were spheres, a median 20 feet. Triangles of a median of 170 feet were consistently reported to hover, did not produce electromagnetic effects, and were often noted to have an absence of sound. The combination of unusual kinematic range and absence of sound was found in 16 reports, which specifically mentioned objects that hovered, 
traveled faster than Mach 1 and exhibited an absence of sound. And it gives a breakdown there. The third presentation was called Occupational Safety and Reporting Guidance, Reviewing UAP Safety Events. Now, this is, yet again, focusing specifically on safety issues, both in terms of how to report it when it's happening and how to report it afterwards and, and how this is affecting the, the flight crews as they're experiencing the, the event. And uh, one of the, the only replies so far is from Robert Powell saying, good detective work, Keith, on, I guess, sussing out the abstracts. Meanwhile, over at the Black Vault, Dot com. That's uh, John Greedwald Jr.'s site. This one released July 31st. Unreleased FBI documents shed light on Lieutenant Colonel Philip Corso's controversial claims. This, wow. So Philip Corso is a controversial figure who put out a book claiming what had already kind of been circulating in terms of mythology, this idea that we, did re we have retrieved crashed saucers, that they have been reverse engineered, and that there has been a, a pipeline for rolling out new technologies that have been derived from the reverse engineering of these, these technologies. And this is not a very flattering report. And I want to, after reading some of this article from John Greenwald, read some excerpts from Jacques Vallée's Forbidden Science Volumes 4 and 5, where he touches on Corso, because of course those journals from 1990 to the 2000s cover that period of time when Corso's book came out and the resulting controversy over it. So Corso served in the U.S. Army for over 20 years, primarily in intelligence roles, gained notoriety with the publication of his book, The Day After Roswell. In it, Corso claimed he had direct knowledge about the recovery and analysis of extraterrestrial technology from the Roswell incident, which he alleged was reverse engineered to advance American technology. Despite his fame in the UFO community, the newly released FBI files focus on his broader interactions with the government, but make no mention of his UFO stories. What a portion of these documents do deal with is a 1964-65 request. Perform a name check on Corso. A name check is a thorough search conducted by the FBI to investigate an individual's background, ensuring there are no red flags or derogatory information that might affect their, sustain their suitability for certain roles or positions. This process is particularly crucial for individuals being considered for sensitive government positions or committee memberships. In this, in this instance, the name check on Corso was initiated because he was being considered for a position on the Immigration and Nationality Subcommittee of the House of Representatives. So it goes into some de detail here, saying the memo went on to detail one incident in which Corso provided General Arthur S. Trudeau with a list of individuals he alleged were quote-unquote Fabian socialists within the U.S. government. Fabian socialists are members of a British socialist organization founded in 1884 advocating for a gradual transition from capitalism to socialism through reform rather than revolution. Huh. This term was used by Corso to label individuals within the U.S. government whom he accused of subversive activities. The FBI had reviewed its files and found, quote, although the FBI didn't, did find derogatory information concerning many of them, there was insufficient evidence to pr prove the validity of the allegation of Fabian socialists, quote unquote. Another revelation in the FBI files is Corso's involvement in spreading a claim that Lee Harvey Oswald, the assassin of President John F. Kennedy, not, was an FBI informant. According to the documents, Corso admitted to an FBI official that he had disseminated this information, claiming it came from CIA sources. However, he refused to identify these sources, stating his allegations, quote, had been strictly deductions and had no basis in fact. Okay. He further stated that his, quote, CIA friends had no facts whatsoever, and he did not want to reveal their identity. Well, that's <laughs> frustrating. But we'll touch on that in just a second. But here is the really nasty bit of this. The FBI noted that there was, quote, some basis to believe that Corso may have deliberately distorted information concerning this defector and that Corso was characterized by another government agency as a, quote, parasite who has never produced any intelligence through his own efforts, but has profited from information developed by dedicated government agents and investigators. It is unclear which government agency labeled Corso a parasite. Yowza. Now, there's more information here. 
it scans links to the, all the articles that have been released, as well as details, as John Greenwald is always good about doing, that go into the facts of how he obtained these, these files, including details that might help, help others compose their FOIA requests. As he, like so many FOIA researchers over time, you discover how to change the phrasing in your request to elicit more information. So, for instance, the note here is, the original request seeking information from the FBI in Corso was filed back in 2017. That yielded a, quote, no records response. Years later, a reference to an FBI file number was discovered that may have pertained to Corso, so a new request was filed in 2019. However, in this particular request, unlike the one filed in 2017, it included language to request, quote, unquote, cross-references about Corso versus just seeking a main file search. According to the FBI, they considered these newly released files on Corso as cross-references and not a main file, indicating he was never officially investigated by the FBI. Therefore, in 2017, they considered these files as non-responsive, which is why a no-records response was first received. And so he, all, he just says that he's modified his approach and has incorporated that phrasing into all future requests. Now, in looking at some other related documents, I came across this other interesting bit whereby this document had apparently already been around for a while. And let me enlarge that here. And it involves an FBI file that in the search request search result. Online, the Google says, dated August 28, 2014, Oswald was FBI informant and related points covered by President's Commission. And, and these basically are documents that go back, it looks like January 30th, 1964, as well as classification changes. Some lot of scribbled on this document, but basically... A one, the most important part is that they're saying, contrary to testimony, Oswald was never FBI informant, was never paid money for information, was never assigned any symbol number. Procedures we use in informal program preclude the possibility of Oswald's connection with FBI as an informant without knowledge of seat of government. So, again, the denials about that have been around for quite some time. Continuing on the theme of... For your requests, of course, our friends Jack Brewer, Erica Lukes over at expandingfrontiersresearch.org, EFR, they've got a new post, FBI provides records on career intel officer and NICAP advisor. You can go to expandingfrontiersresearch.org and read this article. Jack has been exploring and has put out a book on this subject dealing with the significant <laughs> presence of military people particularly those involved in psychological warfare in the foundation, founding of NICAP, the National Investigations Committee on Aerial Phenomena, one of the earliest UFO groups that became one of the largest UFO groups. And he's just continuing to publish everything he gets through these FOIA requests results. And I thought I'd let you go check that out yourself. But all of this reminds me, including the scientific articles that we've been referencing about this researcher who I've only fairly recently become aware of, Dr. Adam Dodd, who is a communication and media studies professor at the School of Communications and Arts, University of Queensland, who back in 1999 published this very interesting article, Making It Unpopular, the CIA and UFOs in Popular Culture, which is basically putting forth this idea that has long been believed to be true by those of us who've researched these things that, sure enough, the Robertson panel back in the 50s, the result of that panel was basically, we've got to defuse this, this issue of UFO reports and their possible use as a psychological warfare mechanism, both on our part against other countries, but more importantly, as a national security threat, if reports overwhelmed our communications channels, that sort of thing. So this is a, a you know, professional magazine journal published back in 1999 where this article appeared. 
But Dodd, of course, has been writing on the subject. There's a lot more articles of his that you can find online. And uh, we've created a page for links to some of his material there, including his 2018 journal article from the Astropolitics International Journal of Space, Politics, and Policy from 2018 called Strategic Ignorance and the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, Critiquing the Discursive Segregation of UFOs from Scientific Inquiry. And more recently, in June of last year, alien spacecraft allegations suggest the Pentagon has approved conspiracy theories about itself. And that article you can find over at theconversation.com, where he's published about three articles on the subject of UFOs in this now post-2017 period that we are in. And I, I find his articles to be pretty worthwhile. Well... A smattering of uh, science news that you might find interesting can be found in the Flipboard links. This one from sciencealert.com. We've got two from that website. NASA beamed a laser message to Earth from 10 million miles away. This is fantastic news about our ability to communicate with our probes at great distances around the universe, as well as future ways for us to communicate with, hopefully, if we ever get off this rock again bases on the moon or Mars and being able to communicate in a basically the equivalent of a solar system wide, galactic wide, hopefully eventually internet. Also from science alert, boy, scientists mind controlled mice remotely in extraordinary world first nanoparticles in the brains of mice to control their moods and behavior. Quite terrifying if you ask me and sure enough this op-ed over at digitaljournal.com touches on the the scary aspects of this by paul wallace july 31st article the institute for basic science in korea has just opened pandora's walk-in closet en suite and mini bar with mouse mind control this could get a bit grim it's an interesting tale with perhaps too many ramifications. Testing on mice is pretty common. Mice and humans share a lot of biological characteristics. They're the typical guinea pigs for human testing in a lot of medical applications. The current research, which is also being called a neurological breakthrough, is like something out of a cliche-ridden old movie. The control uses nanoparticle switches to control behaviors. The mice were made to socialize, do parenting, and be motivationally guided according to instructions. So this, this article is mainly just an op-ed, as I said, just riffing on the fact that conspiracy theorists like ourselves will get a lot of hay out of this. He doesn't seem to care for that kind of, of haymaking, but he himself is pointing out that this could be a very dangerous issue. And as he says, what if it gets weaponized? The question is whether anyone will get those good points. It's wank candy for wannabe moronic megalomaniacs and other mediocrats. You could sell it to any fool. It's power or something. Yeah. This is the kind of technology that strikes fear in the heart of anybody that realizes just how abused humanity often is at the hands of technocrats and people who often think, well, we can do this but don't think about whether we should do this. That one's from digitaljournal.com. Meanwhile, over at livescience.com, this is largely uncharted territory. Scientists reveal the brain's fear circuit works differently than we thought. New methods applied in live mice suggest that molecules called neuropeptides, not neurotransmitters, play the main role in our response to danger. This is, an, again, as they say, a big sea change in how we understand the ways that fear changes memory and your ability to process dangerous behavior. And this weird one over at fizz.org, new study finds people alter their appearance to suit their names. This just sounds so much like an astrology article or the idea that pets look like <laughs> their owners and vice versa, but they're citing some kind of study and research so check that out and just a couple more things here over at inverse.com Star Trek science advisor reveals how Starfleet quietly fixed relativity it's all about the warp bubbles this is uh, if you're a 
at all a sci-fi fan and, or a Star Trek fan, you've probably already noticed the details of how recent episodes of Discover, Discovery Season 5 have dealt with this idea and replicated a long time question as to, well, why aren't they experiencing the aging paradox? Over at SciPost, PSYPost.org, scientists uncover a fundamental aspect of time perception. And this also, this article over at Magonia, this pelicanist.blogspot.com, yours sincerely, Charles Fort, is a review of the new Chris Albeck edited Letters of the Dam, The Forgotten Investigations of Charles Fort. Great to see somebody using archives and producing new content that helps folks better understand such an amazing, iconic figure in the study of UFOs and the paranormal and strange phenomena. Well, folks, that's going to be it for this week. Thank you for joining us. Please consider becoming a patron. Go to patreon.com slash anomaly archives. We appreciate your support and good night. Good night.